What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, go ahead and hit that thing, and make sure you leave a comment and share the video. Today, I'm bringing James back on for a part two, and I'm bringing him back on quick, and there's a reason why. We're going to talk a little bit about Beaumont. Everybody knows what happened at Beaumont. We're going to talk about some of the things that, you know, he experienced in prison. But anyway, James, how are you today? Doing good, man. How's everything going your way? Going good. Did you like the uh, the video that we did? Yeah, I like the direction. I like I like the way that you uh, conducted the interview, man. I think that you know people want to hear certain stories, but I think that with individuals like yourself and myself, there can be a message behind that stuff, you know. And I think that you you you're starting to get that message out to people. So yeah, I really did like the interview. I appreciate that. And actually, man, something positive happened from the interview. Someone reached out to you, right? Yeah, there was an individual that I met when I first came home from federal prison back in 2011. I worked with him and uh, I was starting to do bad. And he wasn't. We had a we kind of had a had a falling out behind the things that I were doing that I was doing at the time. Well, now his life took a turn. He drinks a little bit too much and does some other stuff. And he reached out and was kind of asking for some help a little bit. He seen he was watching your videos because it reminded me he didn't want to go to prison and stuff like that. So he kind of seen me on there and reached out. So that was a positive thing. That's what's up, man. Even if you, even if this helps one person, man, one video helps one person. Hopefully, it helps a hundred. But even if it helps one and someone can reach out to you and get a little bit of help, that's what's up. And then, like you said, he was watching it to kind of remind him not to go back to prison. And it seems like. A lot of dudes that tune into the show are former prisoners, and it does remind you, like, yo, man, what boots do I want to wear today? And That's hopefully, right. And hopefully it puts them in the right direction not to put on them prison boots and put on them work boots, you know? That's one of the reasons why I decided to do another interview with you, because it keeps me, it, it keeps me mindful of my past. Like I, I, like I explained to you before we started, I work in a place where um, we don't really talk about the past. We try to, we try to focus on the future that God has that God has for us. Right. But it's very important to remember where we came from. And if our story, our testimony can help somebody, some youngster or some individuals that think that's thinking about um, going back to how it used to be, here's stuff from me or here's stuff from you reminds me, look, man, that stuff sucked. I'm not trying to go back to that. That was horrible. So that's why I think it's good to get this type of message out, man. <laughs> No doubt. And really, man, that's the mission, man. Help save kids from going down our road. And now it's turned into, you know, helping dudes that are coming home. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, sometimes, James, all we got is each other, bro. You know what I mean? And that's the truth. And that's why, to be honest with you, I've kind of, I'm not going to take up much of your time on this, but seeing you, you said you've been out 18 months, right? And you just did 18 years. It's a very crucial time in your life. You know what I mean? A lot of people don't make it that long. And this is where they start struggling and society gets to them and things like that, you're doing a very positive thing. And for you to keep in, to you to, for you to stay linked with people, to help you be mindful of, okay, this is what I came from. This is where I don't want to go. It's very important, man. I'm, pr I'm, I'm proud of the things that you're doing. I know we don't really know each other, but you're doing a good thing. And, and, and it's going to just keep it in the forefront of your mind what you're doing when you start having those thoughts about certain things, you know? I'm not going to lie to you, man. There's been a few times where I slipped since I've been home where I was like, on the verge, man. And you know what? I made it past that mark. And, you know, I'm I'm happy that I did. And when I do the show, James, really, it does help keep me grounded. It makes me not forget about, you know, how bad it was or, you know, what I left behind and how I don't never want to go back. And I think it touches a lot of people like that that been in the places that we've been in. You know, we've been in the USPs. We've been where yeah. people are getting stabbed. We've been where there's lockdowns. We've seen people killed, you know? And that's how, you know, I dealt with those things. I dealt with those things, especially in Beaumont. I stayed drunk all the time, man. I, I did my time the way I had to to folk, to cope with certain things, right? Like when I embraced that stuff, when those when those dealt when those doors shut, man, you're alone with your thoughts. And I coped with mine in a in a in a court job. You know, you were in Beaumont and recently, yesterday at eleven thirty, there's a national lockdown. Every prison in the BOP is locked down. Um, we've been through that before. I mean, I have. Yeah, um, me too. <clears throat> so the word is it was between the MS-13 and the South Siders, the MAs, right? They had a, some stuff going on at USP Lee. One of, the, one of the big homies had got killed, I believe. One of the Mexican Mafia dudes got killed, you know, about a year, year and a half ago, I think it was. 
Then they were stabbing each other, and now this thing jumps off at Beaumont. You were in Beaumont, man. What was it like to live in Beaumont? There were so many buses coming in at so many times, you never knew what to expect. It was always very unpredictable. Um, and it blows my mind that you tell me that that happened with those individuals because you would have never seen anybody really from the West Coast on that yard. Like there was a few, there was a few white guys that were from the West Coast on Beaumont at, at Beaumont at the time. And, uh, but you would have never seen any Spanish individuals from the West Coast on that yard. So it just blows my mind that, that that happened there with those people. But it was dangerous because you had – sometimes they would just – people would get thrown out there to test the waters to see if they could walk there. So you never knew what to expect, man. It was like a minefield most of the time. Like you said, the BOP don't really care, man. They will throw people out and say, let's see if we can put this group on this yard. If it works out and no Absolutely. one gets killed, then we know we can put that group there. But – if it don't work out, then we won't put them guys over there right now. Absolutely. I seen it at the I seen it at Beaumont. I seen it at Victorville. I seen it everywhere I went, especially in the SMU program, where you would have individuals trying to work things out. But then you had, you know, the the administration would just be like, okay, let's see if they're still really big. Let's put this guy, let's put this one guy in a cage with five other individuals to see if they get him or not. You know, that's the that's the way it looked to me anyway, you know. You know. You're you're an upstanding, law-abiding citizen now. You're no longer a prisoner. You're no longer a gang member. You're a new person, right? And right. You, you do work in the court system. You work in places, and, and you try to help people, or you have. But do you really feel that the BOP goes out of their way to put dudes in a position where they could be killed? It sure looks like that at some time. I tell you, I think that, you know, I, I watched that interview you had with that guy, and I commented I, I felt like his – his mental capacity was kind of messed up that interview you did the other day. And I, and he was talking about diesel therapy, right? Well, you know, as well as I do, that stuff is done to people where they put them on a bus and they're, they're going bouncing from, from County holdovers, County holdovers for a long time with no sleep and stuff like that. And it messes with people's mental, mental capacity. Right. And uh, I do believe that if you make somebody mad, or if you, if the administration feels some kind of way towards you, they will put you in a position that can be harmful to your health. Absolutely, 100%. You know, I think they did that to Whitey Bulger. He was doing something with the um, psych lady at, at Coleman. They got pissed off. They put him on a bus, and they sent him to USP Hazleton. He wasn't there but a couple hours, and he was killed. Do you think they knew that he would get killed if they sent him out there on the yard? Let me ask you a question. How long were you in the USPs? I know what the answer is, but the people watching hey, don't. No, I'm I'm I know that's why, but that's why because a lot of people don't know me and they know you, right? So I'm just kind of getting like a verification. So yes, I, I think they knew that because you know as well as I do that people with past like that can't when they go to those yards, they don't make it that long. They come out of there with holes in them. So absolutely, you can't if you know if you're going to a yard like that, they know what's going to happen 100. percent Especially somebody with a high profile case like that. Absolutely. It's only a matter of time. You know, I did a video, too, about a month ago. I think it was called the top five most dangerous gangs in the federal prison system. And at the top of my list was the, was the Mexican Mafia, the Southsiders, right? The Mexican Mafia with the Southsiders with them. And, of course, when we were in there, the MS did run with them cats, at least when I was in there in Big Sandy. You know, there was a couple yeah. MS dudes in Raybrook. They all ran together, bro. In your perspective, I don't know if you've done time with, with any of the MA from over there, but I I'm have. sure you have. Do you think they were the top gang in federal prison? I'll say this about them, especially from spending time in, in Victorville um, and in the smooth programs. Uh, the way that they move is very dangerous. So, absolutely, yeah, I would say that because the way their mentality is structured behind them walls. So whenever they structure, whenever you structure the way you move, in the environment that you're constantly going to be in, it's like, absolutely, I would consider, I would say that, yeah. I feel the same way. And, you know, there were people that hit me up like, oh, man, none of the none of the black cars made it. And I said, look, man, those are cars. Really, they're kind of like gangs. But really, man, these dudes are willing to do things that other people aren't willing to do. Like if the big homie says, yo, go stab the warden, they're going to stab the warden. And, you know, dudes in the D.C. car, if, if you know, if they got a shot caller or whatever, and if someone says, hey, man, go stab the warden, man, D.C. do the blade, man, you go stab the warden. I ain't stabbing nobody, you know? Like, they're not listening to whoever their leader is 
in that regard. But with the Mexican mafia, if the big homie says stab the warden, they're stabbing them. Do you agree with that? I would say that's accurate from a from an outside point of view. Yeah, because obviously I don't have inside information with those people, but I will tell you from what I've seen, they're very they're very uh, militant type or t- type individuals. How about the MS-13? You spend any time with them cats? I did a little bit. There were some in Tucson. I want to say there were some in Tucson. Um, and I'm trying to think. I can't really remember all the details of how that went, how that was with them. I know that there was a few in my unit over there, but I really didn't. They were they hung together. They were they all they they separated themselves together. But at the time, there was a lot of stuff going on in that yard where they're the, the people that was the person that was calling shots for them was was cleaning up over there. So it was a little hectic with them on that yard. You know, I spent some time with a bunch of them dudes that got arrested out of Baltimore and I was in Raybrook with them dudes. I played soccer, bro. I love playing soccer. It took me out of prison later later on in my in my prison bid. And those dudes were always, man, balls to the wall. And I got along with their shot caller over there. And I was yeah. real good friends with one of the South Sires, like really, really good friends. Did a bunch of the you know, my back's blasted out, but he did a bunch of my tattoos. And I remember, man, that MS-13 dude, like, telling me, man, he's like, I don't like these dudes, man. Like, he was letting it be known, like, we want to be our own people and we're getting yeah. tired of these cats. You know what I mean? Well, because they're from, a, most of them, they're from a, they come from a different country. <laughs> like, the one of the, they're from, uh, what is it, El Salvador? El Salvador, yep. Yeah, so most of those individuals, you know, they don't feel like they should have to answer to anybody from over here. And a lot of them, the ones that I met are kind of unhinged. So, I mean, there's a, there's a reason why they, you know, that they blast their face and things like that. They're, they're not, they're not rolling with a full deck, you know? Yeah. I used to feel like some of them were a couple sandwiches short of a picnic. Right. Yeah. And they were, I was cool with a, with a couple of them. The one of the kids was in big Sandy when I was there. He had like 60 something years. His case was out of New York. And you know what, man? He was a real, real nice dude, man. He started going to church. He was just a really nice dude, man. He had all that time. But if it came down to his people, they were with that business, though. They would definitely stab you. Absolutely. That's why the individuals I was around in in Canaan, matter of fact, the ones, the the individuals I was around in Canaan, very respectful. Um, Never, like I said, it. I'm, I was very thankful they didn't get involved in that stuff that I had going on with the vices because, you know, there was quite a few of them there. And they, 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 uh, at that time, whatever they had going on, they weren't, they weren't, uh, they didn't move as a, as a whole with those guys. So they had something going on. I don't know what the particulars was, but, uh, yeah, there were some very serious individuals. But one thing that I know, I was with one of their bigger individuals. I, um, in Pennsylvania, in Lewisburg, um, very respectful, man. Like we would talk through the cages and stuff. Sometimes they put us, they put people side by side, you know, and we'd be out there doing burpees and stuff together and, uh, very respectful, but you can tell there's a, uh, they listen for a reason. You know what I mean? Like they listen to what that guy's saying for a reason. You know, that's, that's the other thing I can say about, you know, the Mexican mafia and the Serenios and, Yo, them dudes, like I talk about them in my book, man. I was real cool with this kid, Sad Boy and Droopy. And them dudes are, it's like their their stuff is planned, dude. Like they don't make, they don't do sloppy things. You know what I mean? Like one dude said, if you, you know, you play silly games, you win silly prizes. Yeah. Those guys go big and they win big prizes, man. Well, there was a lot, you know, when they started the MSMU programs, it was for individuals that had, multiple hundred series shots and violent stuff like that. And and there was a bunch of them there. So there was a reason why they were in places like that. So I want to go back to Beaumont because that's where all the news is at right now. It's in Beaumont. How do people get out to, you know, be able to kill two people in one day? How is that even possible? What would you say? So listen, because I don't want to confuse you, James. This is, this is the thing, right? Some people watching the show probably think prison, like people are locked in cells and they can't walk around. And But really, we're out and about free all day long. There's metal everywhere. We can, you know, we can make knives. We can sharpen knives, you know, concrete, things like that. And some people don't know that, man. I think that I tell you, well, so, you know, in the in in Beaumont, it was, the hole was always overcrowded. You've never been there, right? Okay, so the hole was always overcrowded. I told you about the time they had to put me 
uh, they put me in a, a cell that was four or five of us in, in a cell. They put me with some ABT dudes with, with Swift in them because they were overcrowded. So, what you know, is whenever they get overcrowded like that, they're very they're sloppy in the things that they do. They're not they are not paying attention. They think that they think that they can do whatever they want with no consequences to from the uh, from the uh, the convicts. Right? They just you know they they think because that door's there that everything's going to be okay. They'll just put you in there and you're like now now you're a number and you're stuck behind this door and it's it's you guys just do whatever you want. They think that we're going to do it to each other. And they don't worry about themselves. They don't think that no one's going to do anything to them, right? At the time, I think that uh, they just got sloppy, man, because I got there right around that time that that happened, um, like right after that happened. And I was in whenever I went to, I told you when I got to Beaumont, it wasn't a few short weeks later, I was in the hole. Well, Snuff was back there in the hole. You were over there right after they had killed the dude, right? Yeah. Were they, you're talking about, you're talking about where, Hit snuff and his 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 cellmate slipped the cuffs, hit the cop, got into the cell and killed the DC dude. Right? No, that you see, you're talking about snuff. I'm talking about Kramer and Ricky Fackrell, right? Which they're convicted. They both got the death penalty. I know the incident that you're talking about too. Okay, I was confused. I'm sorry. Snuff, where was snuff from? Utah. He was a Utah dude too, and they killed a black DC dude in the hole, right? Yeah, because the dude, the dude was was talking crap through that through the uh, door, and they ended up slipping them cuffs. They ended up slip. Suppose they slipped them cuffs, and they they ended up hitting that cop, took the keys, and got in that cell and killed that dude. I thought that's what you were talking about. I can't remember the incident you're talking about. No, yeah, I was talking about Ricky and them guys, but I did a yeah. video on it, man. I'll, I'll send you over some pictures. Okay. Um, I got pictures of the dude, their homeboy. They killed, they killed one of their brothers. But, but um, so they go in the cell. You know, people are like, "What do you mean they were talking junk through the door, man?" Do you know what was happening? What was the black dude saying? Was it kind of like the Troy Kell thing? Yeah, he was just talking real bad. Are you talking? You're not talking, dang man, because there was a bunch of incidents that happened around that same time. Because the dude that was out of uh, Baltimore, the the Murder Inc. dude or whatever it was, got in some stuff over there too, where they killed their they killed their roommate. You know. Do you know about that incident? No. The dude from um, the Sweeney guy, you know, you ever heard of that? Yeah. Sweeney? There was, yeah. he They did, they supposedly got, did something like that too over there in Beaumont around that time too. So I thought there was a bunch of incidents like that where stuff like that happened right at the same time. The one you're talking about though, that was a white dude from Utah, right? Yeah. And his roommate was a Mexican dude, TS dude. I read about that. I think I read read about that article today on the video that I did. Um, yeah. No, I know it was a white dude and a Mexican dude, and, and I know that they killed the dude, but. So they were on the way to wreck, and they told him, hey, can you do something? And they they slipped, dude slipped the cuffs and came up out of him and hit the, hit the officer. And one of the officers left the other officer back there, man, left him, took off and shut the door. Ran off the tier, right? Yeah, ran right off and left that other officer with him. What did they do to the cop? Nothing. They just took the keys and went in that oh, cell hit, and killed the dude? Yeah, no, they hit him a few times. Stab him? Yeah. And then the other dude, how many times I think they how many times they hit the dude in the cell? Not for sure, but he he didn't make it. Yeah, he didn't he didn't make it through. That place was like the wild, wild west back then, right? Absolutely. That was one of the most the most craziest things I've ever seen in my life. It was uh very stressful, very intense. You didn't know what to expect from day to day, man. Very, very chaotic. You know, I heard different names. Like, um, I heard people call them Big Sandy, Big Candy. You know, after they're like, oh, it ain't the way it used to be. It's Big Candy. They said Buddy Beaumont. Instead of Bloody Beaumont, they started calling it Buddy Beaumont. I mean, they just showed them that it's still, it's not Buddy Beaumont. It's still Bloody Beaumont. You know what I mean? Yeah, so... So whenever they got us out of there, it was going into, I want to say the end of the beginning of 09, I think it was, I get my dates messed up sometimes, but whenever they, they should, when they turned it into a medium, when they turned Beaumont USP into a medium, um, they thought they were going to calm it down. Right. And people were still, still getting it. They, what they did was they took a lot of COs from the, uh, from the camps and stuff. Well, they made it worse, man. Like they come in there trying to, 
trying to run things like you would a camp and a medium and stuff. And it just started going. I think, I think they finally got things under control for a little bit, but you'll know that that stigma is not going to just go away. Let me ask you this lump. I mean, uh, James, I'm going to call you lumpy on here. I apologize, bro. Um, let me ask you this. When someone's getting stabbed, right? Do the cops run up there right away and save them? What do the cops do, man? Cops in the unit. You're, I mean, you've stabbed people, bro. So, you're stabbing a dude in the unit. What does the cop usually do? You know, from what I've seen on the outside looking in, it seems to me like they're not. I've only seen a few times where somebody's actually worried about the safety of another in, of, of an inmate. What I've seen is uh, they're going to wait till there's enough officers to break the situation up. That's what, I mean, I've seen people, you know, there was an incident in Beaumont where I watched two individuals use things about this, but every time they hit somebody, it knocks sparks off the concrete. And that, I'd say that lasted for a full minute. And, but, you know, once they, once they get enough individual, I think that they're more worried about their safety than trying to save that individual. That's, that's what I believe. If I worked there and I seen someone getting stabbed, I'm not jumping on them either. I'm like, no, yeah. I don't know. I'm not I mean, you know, my life. Yeah, you know as well as I do that that somebody's if somebody's hitting somebody it, and somebody grabs you, your first instinct is to turn around. So I understand where they're coming from. I get it. I, I understand, but I don't think they're. In my opinion, is their first priority is not to save. To, I think it's to defuse the situation, not to save somebody's life. It's to contain the situation. I feel the same way. So I want, you know, the reason I asked you that is because there's some young dudes watching this, man. Dudes are in the street. Dudes are getting money. Yeah. And they might think, man, shit, the cops will save you, man. But in federal prison, it's not really like that, man. The no. cops don't come to save you. And they're scared. And I'm going to tell you something. Because of all the violence going on, they're scared. I watched, I'll, I'll be honest with you, man. I watched, I was sitting there in Beaumont and there was some stuff going on. It was with the uh, East Coast individuals and Two guys was going to jump on somebody and one of the guys couldn't fight real good. So he was hitting this guy like this, like with an uppercut with his hand closed, pants closed. Well, the, the guard towers in Beaumont are real short. They're real low. And uh, I watched, I watched that, that correctional officer lean out that window with a pistol because they were right under it on the, on, on the walkway going to chow. And uh, shot that dude right. Told him, "Hey, put the knife down." Dude says, "I ain't got no knife." And went to get him again because he just couldn't really fight. He was. It looked like he was like stabbing him or whatever. Dude shot him right in his chest, man. Put him. Put one right in his chest because he was. The dude was probably undertrained and scared. You know. I've seen plenty of cops and they're scared. I remember being, and this is a south uh, south sider thing. The kid I just told you about did all the tattoos. We were in Big Sandy together, and. I remember the cop, he lived two doors away from me. You know, I'm standing out there on the railing. You ever stand out there on the railing? Oh, yeah. So I'm standing out there on the railing watching the unit, and the cop says, hey, I need you guys to step out. He was a tattoo man. They had a couple, you know, bags of wine in there, whatever. He said, I need you guys to step out. And I remember the Serenio dude told him, hey, look, man, check this out, right? He said, we ain't fit for a cell search. And the, and the cop was like, well, I need to search. He said, I told you we're not fit for a cell search today. And the cop just walked away and left it alone, man. You've seen shit that, like that? Yeah, that's what happened to me. That's why I got put in the SMU program. Um, it was almost, I, I want to say it was almost Thanksgiving. And one of, one of the guys I was uh, running with was I had the room sealed off. And there was some uh, wine and some moonshine going on, right? And uh, CO, I think he was, I think he was new to the unit. And he was walking around and he tried to go in that room. And I was like, hey, man, you can't, now ain't the time. Well, he, you know, he hit the deuce and he tried to go off in the unit. Well, he tried to go off in the cell. Well, guy that was in there is like, hey, man, I'm not. You, you got to get up out of here. Normally in stuff like that, when they find stuff like that, they'll tell you, you know, just pour it out. Well, this dude wasn't used to situations like that. I think he because it was, you know, can't hit the complex. I think he was used to working at the medium or whatever. He, he freaked out, man. And he was like, you know, turn around, cuff up and I'm going to have some people or whatever. So Joshua, he wouldn't flush. He wouldn't uh, pour that stuff down the drain. So I'm standing there and it escalated. And there's about, 
I'd say about 15 cops came off in there and they're trying to take him to go, oh, well, he jerks away from him. The guy hits him. Well, I come running down there and I hit the, I hit the cop and ended up turning it into a big old deal because the dude didn't know how to handle that type of situation. Josh, a DWB or no? Yes. Yeah. So the cop hit him and you're like, yo, I'm about to handle this. Yeah, I had to. I mean, at that time, the way I lived my life, I had to. There was no, it was, there wasn't no choice in the matter. That's the way, that's what I signed up for at the time, at that time in my life. So when you hit the cop, what does the cop do? Does he start trying to fight you back? You're a pretty big dude, bro, for people that don't know. He hit, he hit me first. So whenever I ran, I, I ran to the situation, the dude seen me coming and got me and, uh, I hit him back and, it's, you know, I didn't have a bunch of time, dude. So when I hit him, I was like, Dang. I was like, man, this is, this is not going to be turn out. Okay. Well, then they all, they, they, they bum rushed me as soon as I hit him and, you know, it didn't turn out too good for me, but, uh, I actually, I actually got out of the hole for that, you know, cause they came, they came back there and asked me if that officer hit me and I was like, no, because he didn't, you know, and they asked me, they asked him if I hit him, he said, no. So they let me, I ended up getting out of the hole for that. Two days later, a couple of days later or whatever, right? And uh, uh, that was the time, though, they were building up, getting everybody ready to go to the SMU program. So they were trying to keep, at the time in Victorville, they were trying to keep the holes as empty as possible because they they get a mass thing. They started locking everybody up to get everybody ready to go to the SMU program in Lewisburg. That's, that's one prison where – Victorville, where the cops are known to actually beat up some inmates over there, right? That's what I hear. I mean, they pick, you know, they pick me up off when they got me down on the ground and they put me in the shackles. They pick me up about that high off the ground and drop me flat on my face. And that's, you know, so they wasn't. They used to do stuff like that back then, but now they're starting to become a lot of scrutiny on the cops just beating people up, doing whatever they want. But back then they used to do that stuff, right? That's what I hear. I mean, I tried to. You know, I, I feel like, Sid, a lot of those situations, man, you know, you have people that are going to spend the rest of their life in prison. And if you if you approach them in that manner, they're going to respond and they're going to think that that's the way you want to handle it. So I think that sometimes those that that um, it was a it was a, a mutual thing. A lot of a lot of that type of inner like, you know, they made a cop fight. And I think that. It was like, okay, you want to talk to me like that once you come in this cell? And a lot of them did that at that time. But I ain't going to lie to you. I had an incident like that with a cop in uh, in Coleman, right, in the hole, where he was talking shit, and I spit on the glass. And I was like, man, fuck you. You ain't going to do nothing, right? And he's like, yeah, you, you want to go in the laundry room? And I'm not, I'm not going to lie or sugarcoat it, bro. I was like, yeah, I want to go in the laundry room. I didn't think this dude would ever open the, open the door back then. He yeah. opened the door, bro, and, and the wolf ticket that I was selling – I had the cash, and I went down yeah. and fought. This dude was a big dude. He was from Michigan, yeah. and uh, I fought that dude in the laundry room, dude. And, and for real, man, he was a tough dude, man. I got my eye busted open, got a little cut on it, got a scar there. And, and at the end of the thing, we were both like, you done? I'm like, man, I'm done, man. He's like, I'm done too. And years later, the lieutenant, as crazy as this is, I see the lieutenant, right? That was the, the shoe lieutenant then. He's the captain when I get the Raybrook. And he's like, hey, man. You know, I, I probably shouldn't let you walk my yard. And I'm like, damn, bro. I'm like, man, I'm close to home. I'm not like that no more. And, you know, that dude could have pulled the string on me right there, dude. I could have ended up in Butner the first time I yeah. was close to home in all them years. But yeah. I, I've been there before. And some of them dudes would fight you. And they're not, you know, they're not all punks, man. They're not all pussies. Like, no, you know, like oh, I'm no. I think that I think a lot of them start um, identifying with that convict mentality, man. You know, I, I really do. I think that they start looking at how, how individuals handed, handled themselves and they start picking up the lingo and they start picking up the mannerisms and things like that. And the, so they figure like, okay, I got to clock in and come here every day and I have to do this. So I'm just, if you, if you got a problem with me, I'm going to handle it. So I don't have to watch my back and they're going to respect me. And I, you know, I've seen a couple, I've seen it like that when I was at Arizona, there was this CO that got down like that. And I never personally, that never went my way. I never had to go. I never walked into a cell with a CO like that. The only incident I ever had like that was when I, when when that incident with the moonshine and stuff happened. So the captain that I'm talking about, um, he ends up leaving Raybrook, right? And I think he goes over to USP Lee and becomes an associate warden. 
And there's a dude in the wreck cage over there. And the story was, and this is probably about five years ago, six years ago. Like you said, they get that convict mentality. They went over to Lee County, man, and they killed the dude in the wreck cage. And, you know, the cops are like, oh, that dude's going to go to prison. He's get, He got arrested. I don't know exactly what ended up happening with him, but it was Captain Phelps. He had like this weird head. But for real, man, he he was really like, man, I know it's crazy. Dude, the dude did like CrossFit. He was like a he was like a convict, bro, and he was the captain. Uh, so there is a thin line between convicts and cops. Do you believe that? Yeah, I do. I do. I think that they, like I said, you know, especially in USPs, it, it starts getting so wild. They gotta they they get paid to go in there and do that, but they're putting their they are putting their life on the line because if they you, you know if they say the wrong thing to somebody or do the wrong thing and it, it's only you know piece of metal can go right through anybody. So I think that they start they start watching how people move and how people act and start picking up that same man, that that same behavior so they can survive. And I think it starts polluting their minds, man, or something. I think things really started to take a turn when that cop got killed in Kane. And I, you know, when I went through there and it was like they were like that was horrible. The cops that was horrible. Were, the cops were like a gang, bro, over there. They had these shirts on that said, uh, I'd rather live i'd rather die standing up than live on my knees usp yeah. lewisburg and usp canaan and i was just like yeah they're on some gang shit they're on some gang yeah. shit over here i was there i told i think we talked about that i was there when that happened to eric to that to that ceo what was it like living there man after the cop gets killed how because you know how did they treat the white dudes because they felt like the white dudes should have helped them right i mean you know we got we got those box lunches for we got those little little sandwiches for a while and it was it was uh it wasn't a it no that dude wasn't a white dude that got him that dude was that dude was running with the Mex no, I, uh, I know mexico that. Guy. i did a video on him but i heard that yeah. the cops felt like the white dude should have helped the dude when the dude was yeah killing. i heard i heard something about that but it, it wasn't i was in a different unit like i was you know i think um i don't know how the units were like in big sandy stuff because i've never been there but so, like with our unit, you can look through the hallway where the where the uh, all the case workers and stuff are, and see into the unit next same door. Thing. Same thing in Big Sandy oh, and all that. Okay, so so whenever that happened, like we didn't, know, I didn't know what was going on. I looked, we looked through that thing, you know, trying not to draw attention to it, and you just seen somebody getting dragged down the stairs, bro. It was so bad that people that you seen people locking themselves in their cells, like didn't nobody want to get involved in that. Nobody wanted to get involved. Now, and I heard people, you know, they were trying to say, well, you should have, you should have stopped it. And I'm going to be honest with you at the, that time in my life, I wouldn't have stopped it either. Not at that time in my life. I wouldn't have got involved in that. I definitely wouldn't have gotten involved in it either. And I'll be no, honest with absolutely. you. Absolutely. I wouldn't get not. involved in it right now. And I've changed my life. I wouldn't, man. It's just, I'm not going to go. I'm not putting my life on the line for the dude. Cause he wouldn't put his life on the line for me, bro. That's how I feel. Some people might watch the video and be pissed off, but Man, in that environment, you can't do stuff like that. Yeah, that's not that's not that's not something I would have got involved in at the time, dude. I I remember when that whole thing and it lasted for a long time, like it went on for a minute, and that dude did some very bad things, man. Well, I mean, hey, some sometimes people unleash violence and and anger and hatred on other people, and, and you know. Me making that comment, I want to ask you, even though you were down for the homies or whatever, right? You were going hard for DWB. But do you think a lot of that had to do with, you know, you were just angry inside, like angry at life, angry at, at being there? Just, I mean, what motivated you besides the, the dirty white boy gang, right? Okay. Mentally, did you so, feel like you wanted to unleash your pain, the pain that you had from your past? I, did, I, I tell you, like, I wasn't never... I wasn't never that guy to blame me being locked up on anybody else. Right. I take, I always took it. Look, I did it. I sold drugs. I did these things. I carried guns. I got myself put in here, but I was mad at myself too, because I got myself put in there. So, and also I'm going to be honest with you, man. And I don't have, and I say this, I have no ill feelings toward law enforcement. Now I'm not mad at any correctional officer or, or police officer or anything like that. But at the time, you know, some people treated you like you were less than human, man. And they, the way that they conducted themselves and they felt like they could talk to you and the way that they treated you, uh, I, I had an animosity like that and a built up anger. And um, yeah, and that's, I, you know, you, you, you get treated, you get, 
you think twice before you just jump on a correctional officer. You know, anybody in prison thinks twice before you just do something because you know that's gonna it's gonna turn out bad. But there's only so much, man, you can take from somebody treating you like like you don't matter. You know, only so much you can take. You know, I ended up making it, bro, to a low, as crazy as that sounds. I did my last nine months at a low. And for some reason, I had to, there was this um, African-American female officer. She used to search my cell all the time, man, destroy it, not pick the stuff up. And I'm just like, what's up with this lady? Why, you know, why me? And they were starting to get to a point where in my mind, I'm like, I'm ready to snap. Because like you said, man, sometimes they treat you like you're less than a human being. Like they can just treat you like shit kick you down the stairs, do whatever they want. And sometimes, like animals attack, man, people get tired of that. They get tired of being treated like that. And some people might be like, well, you're in prison. Yeah, well, I'm in prison, but I shouldn't be treated like shit either. I shouldn't have my personal yeah. belongings thrown around, my mail thrown away, my pictures ripped in pieces. I've seen it all, man. Yeah, and you know, I, I don't know about everybody's experience, but I never made it my goal to be disrespectful to a, to a police officer, right? Like, I never made it. I wasn't, I didn't. I didn't blame them for me being there, right? Like I didn't have no animosity for for towards them for me being incarcerated. So, but it's 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 one of those things where where sometimes, man, you know, I feel like um, they pushed a lot, man. Like they 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 pushed to a point where where you just like, it's like, seriously, you get to go home every day and I live, I got to live in this box every day. And you want to be, you want to talk to me like, um, like I'm a second class citizen because I'm here. So I didn't feel like that. I never felt like that was okay because I didn't approach them like that. So it was just, man, I just, yeah, I didn't never, I don't understand where that mentality comes from, man. Me, you know, I never, ever, not <laughs> one time, the whole time I was in prison, did I ever go out of my way? The same thing you said. I stayed away from the cops, man. I didn't disrespect yeah. them. I didn't want no smoke with them. I didn't want no rhythm. I didn't want no conversation. Yeah. I just wanted to do me. You do you. You're here to do your job, and I'm here to do my time. Just leave me alone. But, you know, like we said, a lot of times they feel that the punishment has to come from them, and they forget that's that right. the punishment comes from the court, not from the correctional officers. That's And that's a good point because, you know, we're doing time. Every day that we're away from family, we we made that mistake, and we're, we're paying our debt to society. So. It's unnecessary for them to make your time harder, but some of it believe that that's their job. Some individuals believe that they're there to make your time miserable. You know, they use that terminology a lot. This is their house, right? They, they use that. Well, this is my house. You're going to do what I say. A lot of the violence and stuff that happened towards correction, towards correctional officers could be avoided 100%. It could be avoided if people would just think before they they treated people the way they do. Most people, like you said, a lot of guys, you know, we don't want issues with the cops. We don't want to be no. with, the, with them because we do think like, you know, even if you had a 40-year sentence, you think, damn, man, they might change the law. I might be able to get out of here someday. I don't want to stab this dude. You yeah. know, and, and, and people think like that. Like you said, you think twice, like, man, if I do this, I'm going to the ADX probably. Yeah. Definitely getting a maybe a life bit. Definitely if you kill him, maybe the death penalty. Death penalty for sure, probably if you kill a correctional officer in prison. But uh yeah. people do think twice. But like, and I think the cops know that. It's the ones that go out of their way to be nasty, they're like, they ain't gonna do shit. And then that's sometimes right. they run into someone that will do something. Yeah. And that's you know, that's what that that's the thing, man. You uh you, you're gonna think twice because if, when you do that, it's a good it's gonna be turned into a bad deal for me. For you. You're going to end up in some dark, dank hole somewhere going to court for a couple of years. And you're probably going to end up in ADX for some years or whatever. But you know, as well as I do, you're, you're going to be treated horrible. So you think there is a you, you think twice before you do that. And I think that some people play on that. They think that they can do anything they want because there's not going to be any consequences because of what will happen. And I think they, they take advantage of that and exploit that. I believe the same thing, man. What do you think was the worst prison you've ever been to? Definitely Beaumont. I would say, like, what, when you say worse, like, what way? Like, I mean in every way. I mean in violence, okay. in, in the food, in the way you're living, in the way the cops are, the heat, um, no fans, or maybe the air conditioner. I mean mostly, though, just, you know, just 
fucked up living, man. Excuse my language, but bad living. The SMU, the SMU program, the smooth program, absolutely, hands down. No, I asked you that because I thought you were going to say that, and that, that's where I'm going right now. In the SMU program, how many times you go to bed hungry over there, man? All the time. Yeah, it was bad because, you know, so I think I touched on this whenever – Whenever we got there, we had that incident on the bus and we didn't get into we didn't get into Lewisburg till late at night because of that, because the, the guy got hit on the bus. So they pepper spread us. They took us all in there. They uh, they got us all processed in. But uh, when we first got there, you couldn't have you couldn't have radios. You couldn't have coffee. You couldn't have anything. And when they told they. They told us it was supposed to be like a step up program. Like you'd be there for a certain amount of time. You, you couldn't even order your own hygiene products. Nothing. You couldn't do anything. So the first two days there, we went on a hunger strike because of that. Wouldn't eat, or I think it was like the yeah, first week or whatever, went on a hunger strike just so they would sell us hygiene products, coffee, and things like that because that wasn't happening. Because they didn't have that stuff in place. Over there when it first opened, you were probably over there with AJ and Chad and Raz and all yeah. that. They all, all of, first opened, yeah. Yeah, we were all we were yeah we were all like I said they would put us right next to each other. So I can't remember unit housing units and stuff like that right now. But whenever we first got there, they put you in. Um, they I guess it used to be the old hole for Lewisburg, and there was a uh, there was a uh, showers in the cell right there and stuff. And when we go when all of us right there, that's when I was on the unit with Noodles was there and some other individuals that I knew from Beaumont were all there, but uh, they were all there too. We all, they usually like when they, when they move you to different housing units and stuff like that, they like to keep the group together. So when they moved like, cause you, you get to this cells were, these cells were smaller. And then you move to like, after a few months, you move to a bigger bigger area and then you get to whatever so it was we were always i was around those dudes a lot so you guys all came together for a common goal though where you said hey man we got to stick together and we got to accomplish some things here like we need to buy some hygiene products and we need this to change it, it can't yeah. be this bad yeah it got to the point where you have you ever been involved in hunger strike yeah big sandy okay so we got right to the point where they were about to break out tube feeding they shut off the water and they were gonna make. They were gonna strap everybody to the table. You know, they come in there one cell at a time, and they tube feed you and stuff like that. We never made it to that. The captain came in, and one thing I'll say about uh, if if the captain or whatever comes in and tells you they're gonna do something, nine out of ten times it's gonna happen. I, I will say that. Like when they come in there and they say, "Okay, what is it you guys want?" Well, they came down our unit. And they said, okay, what's the what what's the problem here? What do you guys want? Well, you know, there was a list of list of what we wanted, you know, and it was the main thing. Hygiene items, being able to buy coffee, being able to buy some kind of commissary, something. And he told us, okay, look, next week we're gonna make do this, this, and this. Is that acceptable? And most people said it was acceptable at that time, and then the home strike was over. When you're dealing with a captain and stuff like that. They also operate where they want to keep their word too. So, yeah. you know, they want you to respect yeah. them and be like, yo, dude, solid. If there's an issue, man, he says he's going to do something, he does it. If That's not, right. they get nothing, man. You know what I mean? And it goes hard and it goes balls to the wall. Yeah. And if you, and on the other side of that, if you, you know, if they think you're going to do something and you, and you, and you do something opposite, you know, we, I wiggled my way off into a cage with somebody I wasn't supposed to be in the cage with. And I, you know, I told the, I told the SIS individuals that I was, that it was cool, put us in there, everything would be okay. And as soon as they put us in there, you know, we dealt with the individual and, and that turned out bad because, you know, I lied to the guy and stuff like that. But so. Yeah. Then they're like, Hey man, your credibility is no good. You got, yeah, they were mad about, yeah, they were mad about that one. Hey man, you ain't got shit coming from me. That's how it works. Yeah even get any toilet paper right yeah that's about how it works you know i like i said i didn't have i didn't have a relationship with the police officers right that's not i've never had a relationship while i was incarcerated with any kind of correctional officer and things like that i did my time they did their thing so i played like you know if i if i wanted to get 
I wanted to get something done. I said what I had to say and I, I got it done. And they didn't like that. Now, so listen, uh, James, before we go, I'm going to get ready to close the show. But before we go, man, is there, is there anything you'd like to say? Yeah, you know, I just want to keep I want to reach out to the people that that have been out for a little bit. You know, if you've been out for a year, you've been out for a couple of years and, and, and you're thinking about, you know, life's hard right now. My girlfriend cheated on me. I lost my job or whatever. Don't don't give in to that urge to go backwards. Because the thing is, those those doors are waiting to revolve. You can always go back to prison, right? You don't have to do that. What's going to happen is if you start thinking in your mind that there's no hope out here, you're just I'm just going to you're going to get caught in that cycle where you'll never make it out of there. Next thing you know, you can't function out here and you you can't handle yourself out here. So the only thing you know is going back to prison. You don't have to be like that. Don't don't give in to that. Go do something else. Go go find somebody. Ask for help. Get on one of these channels. that somebody that's out here trying to trying to help you get on here and make contact. Find a church family. Try to find somebody that will help you do something different because it's real easy to make mistakes. It's real easy to find somebody that will help you fail, right? It's real easy. You you can go anywhere and help and find somebody that will help you make that same mistake that caught you that first bid or that second bid and that third bid. And then it just becomes, it just becomes repetition, right? It's like it's easy to make mistakes, so I'm just going to keep doing it because it's easy. This Living this other life's hard. It is hard, but it's worth it. You know, I've been out here – since 2013, man, or yeah, well, I came here in two, I've been out of any kind of incarceration since 2015 and it's better. It, it's still hard, but it's better. So I encourage you, if I have anything to say, there's hope. And I, like I said last time, just keep going forward. Don't go backwards, man. You don't have to be, you don't have to be one of those, um, uh, you don't have to be a repeat offender. You don't have to be a career criminal. You don't have to be. I don't care what anybody's told you that your that your life doesn't matter. It does matter. It does. No doubt, man. It's, that's a real good message. And, you know, dudes that are coming home, like I said, man, sometimes, you know, guys have been in federal prison like us and we've been in some dangerous places. We've been in some bad, you know, situations. We've done some bad things to people. And years later, you regret that stuff. But sometimes we're all we got. Sometimes this channel is all they got. This is the channel that they can relate to because it is about federal prison. It is about the life that they live. And, you know, I say it all the time, man, dude, I answer my emails, bro. Dudes write me, yo, Chad, man, I'm, you know, I'm struggling. I answer them, man. So they can hit me up too, man. And I'm sure that, you know, people that are up there near you, they can reach out to you. They can leave a comment on the channel. I'm sure you're going to see it. So yeah. James, man, again, I appreciate you, man. And I respect you, bro. And, and I respect who you, you know, where you came from, man, to who you are today and, I'm happy that you're doing that, bro. So thank you for, you know, thank you for becoming the change that you seek to see in others. How's that sound? Yeah, I appreciate that, man. And it, and it, it benefits others to see like what you're doing now. You've been, eight, you've been out 18 months and you're telling people that. You're telling people what you're going through. It gives them hope that they can make it out 18 months because there's some people that don't ever make it out even three months and they're already back in the door. There's some people that don't make it out a couple of weeks. It's like, that's why I think it's important for us to tell people, yeah, I've been out seven years. I've been out this long. You can do it. You can make it through. And you had that mentality. You lived that violent life and you made it. I used to live that violent life and I don't know more. It's possible. It is possible. Definitely is, man. I'm going to close the show, man. And again, thank you, everybody watching. This is a really good message. This is the video that you should probably share. And when you share it, say, watch it all the way to the end because it gets real. You know, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video, leave a comment, and we promise to get back. With respect, until tomorrow, Blood on the Razor Wire TV, we're out.